Hello, and welcome to DU's 20th Annual Diversity Summit. We are glad you could join us for this session. In the spirit of healing and peace, we acknowledge and honor the Indigenous peoples of the land upon which the University of Denver stands, the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute tribes. A few reminders before we get started. This year, we as a DU community will be exploring the interplay and intersection of the impact of 2020 through a lens of anti-racism and anti-discrimination. Together, we will examine the many ways in which our collective past informs our shared diversity, equity, and inclusion work for the future. For some, the topics covered may include triggering or emotionally challenging topics. Please feel free to exit the event and return later as necessary. We will be closely monitoring our time together and do not condone threatening or violent language. Rather, this space is meant to provide us opportunities to learn, question, and grow. We hope you will join us in this journey. Please note your camera is off and your microphone is muted. The Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen is for you to ask questions of the panelists. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. This conversation is being recorded and will be made available on Canvas and YouTube within a week of this event. Here's a quick reminder of our Zoom controls. Take a moment to locate the chat. Q&A feature, closed caption, and leave buttons at the bottom of your screen. And lastly, we ask that you share your experience via social media. We will be using the hashtag DU Diversity Summit throughout these seven weeks. And now I would like to um, introduce our moderator for this morning, uh, Nancy Sazaki, to get us started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nancy Sasaki. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, part of my lived experience is that I'm a faculty in the biological sciences department here at the University of Denver. Um, I am also involved in the equity and STEM program with one of our uh, uh, panelists today. And um, also I am a first generation uh, attendee of a college from my family. And uh, so that's part of my experience, uh, the experiences as uh, who I am. Uh, I want to welcome you to our space for women. So many times we have to be a woman plus, right? And it's just really nice to be in a space where the only thing you need to be is um, someone I, who identifies as a woman, somebody who's curious, of, of uh, what the word woman means or an ally of a woman. So welcome to our space today. Um, uh, I'm, before I hand it off uh, to the chair of the Women's Coalition, um, I'd like to say that we're going to have four panelists today. And the task that we have asked our panelists to address is to have um, open and honest conversations. It's called Critical Conversations in our title. Um, around the women's perspective. And we've brought that forward in four different areas today. Um, and um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can uh, begin the slides. Um, so here is uh, who, our, our, my co-moderator is Tally Kuzel Thompson, and she um, will, um, talk about herself as uh, she is the next uh, presenter in our session today. And um, our panelists are Teresa uh, Liguori Hernandez, who will talk about uh, the history of the women's organizations here at DU. Anne DePrince is, uh, we've asked Anne DePrince to come and talk about uh, current understandings of women's experiences, and she is involved in the traumatic stress study group. And so her talk, I'm not going to say much about that because she's going to, I don't know, I want to, you know, it's like a cliffhanger. And Thea Ruin Johnson is going to talk to us about some experiences that she has encountered as being a black woman on the campus here at the University of Denver. But we've also open, asked her to, to decide how she would like to present uh, women of color as she, as she has, uh, as she would like to do. And lastly, we're gonna wrap up with Shelly Smith-Akuna, 
And Shelly, uh, Dr. Acuna will, will present um, the status of, we did a status of women's study uh, about seven years ago, six, seven years ago. And she's going to give us an update of where things are today um, as a result of that study that was done. So I'm going to tell, uh, turn this over to, to Tally, who is the current chair of the Women's Coalition. And Tally's going to uh, let you know more about the coalition as well as do an invitation is, is what I understand. So Tally, off you go. Thank you, Nancy. I am so honored to be in such great company with these women here. Um, as chair of the Women's Coalition, it is my role to bring our women campus leaders together to drive the empowerment of women on campus. Um, I got involved with this because I noticed that the women who are on campus, that there's a lot of, as Nancy said, there's a lot of additional identities that are required from us in order to be diverse. And women, while majority of the students, much of the staff and faculty, still don't have the same place at the table um, based on our um, gender identification. And so I really wanted to foster that place where women could understand that it's okay to just show up as a woman. I'm, I identify as a first generation woman. I identify as a member of the LGBTQIA community, but um, the Women's Coalition is just the starting off. Point for us. It's just a point for women and allies of women to come together and to be a part of this bigger tribe and then to find their micro tribes and to really work together um, for empowerment. And so I'm really excited to be here. I am really astounded to be sharing this space with so many women who have won the Robin Morgan Outstanding Woman Award for their service and empowerment of women on campus. And we are currently accepting nominations for the Robin Morgan Awards. Um, the deadline is this Friday, as well as, pardon me, as well as the John Nichols Ally Award. So we will put the information um, for the Her Do You Conference, the Women's Coalition Awards, we'll make that available for you. I really hope that you can nominate. And if you wanna be a part of Her Do You, either as an attendee or a presenter. It's gonna be the first week of April this year. It will be all virtual and we are accepting RFPs through March 1st. So we'll make sure that information is available as well. And I think the most important thing for me right now is we are actually restructuring the women's coalition right now. It has been a space where leaders of women's groups on campus have come together in the most recent iteration, but we need more. We need you all. And we are gonna be looking for ambassadors from the students both undergraduate and graduate, the staff and the faculty. We are going to be looking for representatives for each unit and we are going to be forming committees that are going to move our strategic goals forward. And I invite all of you to keep an eye out for our info sessions that are going to be coming up in March and get further involved because it is rewarding work too. And this is the work that breaks down the silos. So thank you so much. Um, and then I think we are ready to bring Teresa Lagore Hernandez to the, the, the virtual space. Um, I adore Teresa. She was one of the first women that made me feel a really, like I was a really big part of something special on this campus. And so I look forward to her sharing our history. And if you have any questions for her, she has a wealth of knowledge. So welcome Teresa, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And um, I somehow through the years have assumed the role of the uh, person of a lot of knowledge about the Women's Coalition and the history of the Women's Coalition. So um, it's wonderful to have a moment to share that with all of you. Some of you may know some of this and some of you may not. I put a brief slide together here. And while I'm talking, you could look at some of the um, key moments that happened in our history um, as women at the university. Um, I joined the university in 2003 and um, I had moved away from um, New Jersey and I knew nobody. And um, on campus, um, my first encounter with um, a group that I thought I could maybe um, find friendship um, and, and camaraderie was the women's groups. 
and I joined one of the women's groups and I've been a member since. So um, I do have a long history with the women's groups. Um, and I also identify as a first generation as well. Um, and I know that we all um, identify in different ways, but again, this is really about us being women and what does that mean at, at the university? As you can he see here on this slide, there, have been, there is a lot of history, um, but the University of Denver was established in 1864, and you can see it took us a while to get some momentum <laughs> um, by this slide. The first um, women's conference, it was called a Women's Renewal Conference, was in 1995. And after that conference, there was a, a need, a, a bunch of women got together and said there was a need for us to really address women's issues at the campus. So Robin Morgan, um, an activist, a poet, um, a teacher came to the university as a Leo Block scholar in 1996 and 1997. And out of her year at the university, her recommendation was for us to form the Women's Coalition. So the Women's Coalition was established in 1997. And out of the, the, this initiative, and um, I will ask our goddess Nancy to forward a slide. <laughs> we um, had six women's groups that were formed. The, the first six were the Women's Leadership Council, which was WLC, the Faculty Women's Association, Women's Advancing Change, which at the time they called WAC, which was a really rough name to have, the Staff Women's Association and Network, which was called SWAN, Graduate Women's Council and Undergraduate Graduate Women's Council, and together they formed the Women's Coalition. With programming specific to each of these groups, um, these alliances began to push change at the university. Task forces and networks were formed, women's issues were being identified and activities around topics of concern were being publicly discussed. This was something we had never done before. However, with all of these efforts being made, there was still major discrepancies and inequalities that were not being addressed. Leadership and membership within these groups were voluntary and depending on an individual's position and the ability to even attend any of these meetings um, was making it hard for us to push our initiatives. And we constantly ebbed and flowed in what we were doing. Um, sometimes we were moving forward and sometimes we were moving back. This went on for many years and we decided to bring Robin Morgan back to campus in 2005. In preparation for that reunion and for her to see what we had accomplished over the past 10 years. The women's groups were also um, asked to come up with a list of their accomplishments, their memberships, their aspirations, what was going well, what wasn't. And after Robin's visit, we once again were reinvigorated, right? We, we really put a chair in place of the coalition and we started having more discussions and meetings and town halls. And we were looking at topics of affirmative action, childcare, women in senior leadership roles, mentoring, gathering um, information around gender and equity, and really trying to create a safe environment for women. All of these issues were being targeted as central subjects uh, relevant to women, but yet we knew that this was not just about women. So we were advocating for others on campus. We were gaining momentum. And what happened was in 2008, 2009, the world saw um, some big changes, right? And we saw some changes also within our groups. Um, women's Advocating Change, that group was really having a tough time with that acronym of WAC and sounding so aggressive, they wanted to change who they were. So they changed their, their name to Connecting Staff Women, hoping that would get more women to become uh, allies and um, join our group. What happened next was the economy took a dive and many of the women in these women's groups were either part of a voluntary separation or their positions were being eliminated at the university. This resulted in some really huge um, re-envisioning for us at the women's coalition level and also in all these groups. But the saddest part was the woman, the woman at the time, Meg Stites, who was our chair of the coalition, her position was eliminated at the university. So that's when I was asked to step in and take over the chair of the Women's Coalition. I was asked by the provost at the time, and this has always been a, a appointment by the provost's office. Um, so I jumped in and I began expanding our boundaries the best we could in a time of crisis. 
We looked at women's ways of partnering, collaborating with other groups and organizations on campus, really forming alliances. We formed alliances with the Women's College, the HERS Institute, the Center for Multicultural Excellence, the Office of Special Programs, the Women's Foundation of Colorado and the Staff Advisory Council. We began networking, mentoring and professional development and targeted opportunities specifically for the six women's groups. But we also realized at that time that we needed to be allies as well. So our efforts expanded beyond the Women's Coalition to the Native Student Alliance, the Staff of Color Association, the Faculty of Color Association, the Dolores Project and Shelter for Homeless Women. The women um, began being part of the University of Denver women, uh, Diversity Summit like we are now. We worked with Mikasa Resource Center. We worked with the Women's College and the Half the Sky Fair. Um, we worked with the Women's Global Empowerment Fund. We helped with the first Black Male Initiative Summit. We worked with Redline, Women in Art, Hands Up for Local Children in Need, um, a local uh, food providing organization for students um, that could bring backpacks home with food in them on the weekends for students that didn't have food um, unless they were in school. And we also realized that there were other groups that needed to join. And so, next slide, Nancy, please. That's when the Association of Sisters in Higher Education joined the Women's Coalition, which was, I believe, in 2010. In the fall, though, of 2009, Shelley will give you more information on some of this, the provost initiated an analysis of institutional data on women at the University of Denver. The, this initiative was um, a request by the women's leadership, and it was comprised of data which we compiled from the Institutional Research Office and compared that data with our peer institutions. The re that report revealed areas in which the university was strong and other areas where we needed to improve. And in a collaborative effort, the findings of that report was presented to the community with support from the Women's Coalition, the women's groups, and new discussions around equity and women at the university were starting to percolate. However, during my time as the chair, I saw what many of the chairs have seen in the past, the ebbs and flows within the groups. The Women's Faculty uh, Association became dormant. The undergraduate and graduate women councils were lacking leadership. We were having trouble with the staff groups, connect connecting staff women and SWAN were seeing overlapping in their memberships and also in their programming. And so, in 2012, they decided to become and merge into one. Um, at that time, um, I believe the groups, I'm trying to see the name, WAN became the Women's Alliance for Networking and Development. And they are still in existence today and very strong. Their mission united uh, together, made it a resource and efforts for all staff women, not a difference between if you were a staff woman in this position or a staff woman in this position. And I think that's always been the problem with the coalition. People don't know where they fit in. Do they need to be invited? Is this a place where I can go freely or do I have to be, be asked to be a member, right? Keeping the coalition running, running and funding has always been time consuming and a really time consuming effort. And this was one of the things I realized as being part of this um, continuing effort and also as the chair of the coalition. So I started um, really being a voice and, and, and trying to drum up anybody who would listen to me um, about this becoming permanently somewhere other than in someone's um, part-time job, as I called it. You know, um, this was not a paid position. This is not a paid position. It was not written into my job description. It was always a passion I had and so, I fulfilled this um, um, role in a way that um, I knew this would help other women on campus. And so I felt good about the work I was doing. I was passionate about it, but I felt that we needed to be somewhere on campus where we could sustain this. So in 2013, I finally got someone to listen to me, a few people, and then the Women's Coalition, along with the Provost Office, Women's Leadership Council, and the Office of uh, Inclusive Excellence, we all came together and we really found a place for the coalition and it was within the Office of, of Inclusive Excellence at the time. Um, at that time, Joanna Leba became the chair and it became part of her role in her leadership within the Center for Multicultural Excellence. And we began again to feel a purpose and a mission and a belonging like we hadn't before. Communication around advocacy and empowerment started again. And it was wonderful to see us reinvigorated. 
again, things started happening um, around us outside the world and we knew we needed more than that. We knew we needed to have a bigger voice. So Women's Leadership Council asked Chancellor Coombe to appoint a status of women task force, which was comprised of many individuals across the campus to take a look really at the issues of women at the University of Denver. This task force expanded their scope of work beyond encompassing uh, beyond women and encompassing people of color and marginalized communities at the university as well. This became a huge, huge mission and task for this group. And the findings of the study were presented in 2014. And I believe Shelley's gonna give more information on that as we move forward. While these efforts um, provided us another means to address the disparities of women at the campus, we still needed to make sure that the women's groups had a home and a place and there were changes coming again in, in now at the Center for Multicultural Excellence and, and their existence and how they should be looked at in a different way at the university. So while they were being reformed, there was a re-envisioning happening at the Women's College. And the, the thought at that time was in 2014 that maybe we should come under the, you know, the Women's College new leadership, which was the Dean at the time, Ann Ayers. We got moved under the Women's Coalition, got moved under the Women's College efforts, and we saw wonderful invigoration of our groups. And um, that's when Tally, wonderful Tally, became our chair. And we have benefited so much from her leadership over the past couple of years. And she has done so much to advocate for all women, engaging new groups. And as you can see here on, on the uh, slide, there's new groups today in the Women's Coalition. And she has done so much to see how we can expand the coalition and the efforts that she's put towards her new vision of the new coalition structure is what we're looking at now as women on campus. We're trying to envision what it looks like to be a woman at the university now in these times. And my co-presenters are gonna share more of that, but I just wanted to give you some background of where we are. And now in 2021, we have been asked to be a part of the new Office of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. This new structure is something we're working through. Um, we're hoping that this will be um, another wonderful um, adventure for the women's groups to see how we can morph and, and change with um, the direction of ODI and all their wonderful initiatives that they're putting forward for us. As you can see here that we have alliances with many of the organizations on campus and this is only continuing to grow. Um, I hope I gave a good quick summary and overview of who we are, where we are, and how we got here. Um, and what I've just given you all um, has been written up and all this history that I had um, my hands on through the years has been put into the archives of the university. So I just want you to know that if ever you're looking for any of this, if you're doing research on any of this, this has all been, it was one of my capstone projects to get this all <laughs> together and in a nice, um, neat, um, orderly fashion for our archives. So thank you all today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for letting me be a part of this wonderful group. Thank you so much, Teresa. I feel like every time I talk with you, I learn something new. Um, and today is absolutely no exception. Um, we have a few moments. If anybody has direct questions for Teresa before we move on to Anne. Um, taking a peek at the Q&A. Okay, we will have time for questions at the end of the session as well. So feel free to chime back in later via the Q&A. And now it's my honor to introduce Anne de Prince. Anne was last year's Robin Morgan Outstanding Faculty Woman Award winner. So it's my honor to present that award to her this year or last year. Um, and it, very bittersweet for me. I don't know how many people actually realize this, but her DU 2020 was the last all campus major event that we had before the pandemic hit. I remember um, I was supposed to fly out to South by Southwest Education Edition the next week and that got canceled that day. And um, the conference is one of my best memories. It's, it's something I hang on to as we work through this pandemic. And I remember how great it felt to be amongst so many of you. And I can't wait to do that again. Um, 
And I'm so honored to be able to share Anne with you and for her to be able to share some of her research and her knowledge. And we are so lucky to have her. So Anne, go ahead. Thank you, Tally. Um, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and for that last wonderful memory of, of the, the before times. Um, it was such a special day. Thank you also to Nancy, um, Teresa, Anthea, Shelley. It's just a, a great privilege to be here today. Um, I am a professor over in the Department of Psychology. Um, I also direct DU Center for Community Engagement, which becomes a part of the story a little bit later on uh, in, in my um, comments today. But I wanted to start by thinking about the critical conversations that I see uh, for women and girls arising out of the research that I, I do. So I work with an incredible team. We call ourselves the Traumatic Stress Studies Group. Um, we are a community engaged feminist anti-racist research team uh, committed to doing intersectional research that seeks to disrupt gender-based violence. Um, a lot of our focus is on violence against women and girls, whether that happens in childhood or adolescence on into adulthood. Um, things like dating violence, sexual assault, domestic violence. Um, we also try to be focused on responding to not only how do we advance science, but how do we address questions in ways that communities can continue to refine and improve how they work um, to prevent and respond to gender-based violence. And I'm thinking about my team's work in the context of what kinds of critical conversations do we need to have um, as women, led by women, uh, and, and, and sort of engaging with folks of all genders on campus. And that, that leads me to some pretty obvious conversations. Um, it may be, or at least uh, let me say, it should be obvious, uh, some obvious conversations. And if my friend Nancy uh, would go to the next slide, please. Um, some of these obvious conversations have to do with um, really serious problems such as sexual assault. And we need look no further than our student leaders on campus and their do better um, movement that began a while back. Um, they have made visible um, the price that young people pay, students, staff, faculty alike, not just young people, but particularly they've made um, uh, visible the, the problems that sexual assault causes for, for students. Um, and I think have just done a tremendous job in terms of agitating for change and showing what student leadership uh, can look like. I think back to another moment in the, in the before times, before COVID um, sent us all uh, apart from each other, one of the most profound events was standing at the silent, um, the silent uh, 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 march that they had uh, on the center quad uh, to raise attention to sexual assault, the silent protest. And being there among women and people of all genders coming out to talk about an issue um, or to not talk, to be silent and recognize an issue that is often thought of as a woman's issue uh, was, was frankly such an important moment um, for me to see as someone who cares about and has worked on these issues for a long time. But here's the deal. Um, we have known since the 1950s that about one in five women in college will be sexually assaulted. That number has not moved for 70 years since the 1950s, study after study after study. So I applaud um, the student movements uh, that are happening on our campus and across the country. Back in the day, I was part of my own uh, generations uh, agitating for change. And that is essential. And yet, if we recognize that one in five is still the number, a, a good solid number that we are estimating in terms of sexual assault, that tells us we have to do something radically different in addition to the things that we have been doing. So if we go to the next slide, that's um, some of what I've been thinking about uh, with my research team lately, is how do we come to do better by recognizing that there are critical conversations that can and should and need to be led by women about sexual assault at the very same time that we work to make sure everybody realizes that sexual assault is actually all of our issues. It's my issue as someone who uses she, her, hers pronouns. It's your issue, regardless of the pronouns you use, regardless of your background. It is our 
issue. So I want to um, make that case for you or give you an example of how I make that case, starting with the next slide, connecting these thoughts to some of my team's research. So if you go all the way back to K-12 preschool, we know things that that we know from research, including some from my own team, that things like witnessing intimate partner violence, witnessing uh, parents fighting, where women are often the victims and survivors in those conflicts, that children who witness those um, kinds of traumas, that that has an impact on their ability to learn. It affects their attention, their emotions, potentially depression and PTSD symptoms. That makes it harder to sit still in a classroom and, and focus when a teacher tells you to sit down and do your math. It makes it more difficult to learn and to succeed in school. And what we see happening is what scholars are increasingly calling an abuse to prison pipeline. This idea that the consequences of witnessing that kind of violence or experiencing violence directly have an impact on your ability to learn. You get in trouble you get pulled out to the principal's office that takes you away from even more class time and you have this cycle begin uh, where folks, uh, children have less access to education, less opportunity to succeed. That problem exists and then it is frankly far worse for black children, for children of color, um, where disciplinary um, differences, inequities, begin as early as uh, uh, pre-kindergarten and in, in elementary school. So if you are sitting um, watching this talk, spending time with us as a DU admissions officer, regardless of your gender, gender-based violence, violence against women, violence that happens in homes is your issue because you are losing children in that pipeline, the, the pipeline that we want to be robust and healthy and wonderful to bring the best and the brightest to DU, you are losing children that don't need to be lost in that pipeline because of the consequences of abuse and violence. So uh, admissions officers, tour guides on campus, this is your issue. It's the case that when students do get to campus uh, and sexual assault happens, or they, uh, students bring with them the histories, the survival, the, uh, the, the ways that they've survived, that you see those same impacts on learning and ability to connect and to trust. And so if you're someone sitting on our campus among the many people working hard on things like persistence and success and helping students get through their college career and onto the next um, stage of their, their careers, then this is your issue too. We share a stake, regardless of your gender, regardless of your own history, in stopping campus sexual assault and making sure that our classrooms are inclusive in a way that folks who have survived and have a trauma, trauma-related issues, problems, things like difficulty paying attention because of that, that they can still thrive in our classrooms, that we are a classroom, we provide classrooms for all. If you're in our career services office or you're thinking about writing letters of recommendation for students, thinking about their next steps into the job market, then this too is your issue. Uh, we know that when um, women go out into the job market, uh, job places can be um, places where harassment and abuse occurs anew there. And so caring about that so that we can build companies uh, that are inclusive, that you do not lose women uh, in the pipeline is so incredibly important. But if you're preparing folks to be supervisors out in the work world, um, we know from research that lots of uh, in people who are abusive in interpersonal relationships use the workplace as a place where they, they carry out their abuse, calling, interrupting, showing up, stalking folks at work. And so you as a supervisor or you as a faculty member preparing someone to be a supervisor in a Fortune 500 company at a hotel downtown, you this is your issue to keep the best workers and help them thrive and succeed. It, you have a vested interest in understanding what abuse looks like and the, what the consequences of it look like so that you can help your workers be safe and healthy and thrive. So from my experience, if you go to the next slide, Nancy, uh, just, just to wrap up, issues of violence against women, um, we have what community organizers, what our, my colleagues over at CECL, the Center for Community Engagement, would call a collective self-interest. We may think some of the issues that we talk about in women's spaces, that they are women's issues, 
And there's a part of this that is. The reality is for much intimate violence, it is gendered in nature. The thing is, we all have a collective interest in solving this problem. Uh, we have an interest in our girls and women in our communities being able to thrive. And that leads me to my full feminist circle and perhaps soapbox, which is to recognize that when we build policies and practices and institutions and traditions where women can thrive, everybody can thrive. When we have childcare policies and economic policies that support support women, it supports everybody, all boats rise. And the same is true when it comes to gender-based violence. Whether you think this is not an issue in your life at all, and that's lovely, this is still your issue. The world is a better place if we figure out how to help women and girls thrive, to live safely, to have control over their bodies, thrive in schools and workplaces, we all win. So thank you for the opportunity to share those thoughts with you today. All right, I'm gonna uh, pick up the podium now and say, uh, wow, I don't know how about the rest of you, but um, that was amazing. Um, uh, and we said that we would have critical conversations and, and this is one, right? This is a space where it's not sugarcoating anything. And so talking, you know, listening to Teresa say about uh, the difficulties of, of establishing a woman's organization, even though more than half of the university students, faculty, staff, uh, uh, staff, and some faculty in certain places are more men, women than men. Why do I feel like we're still so transient in trying to solidify our needs and our, in, in our, um, our, our challenges? Our, you know, why is it that I still feel so transient on this campus? So hopefully we have enough energy and we're gonna gain some today uh, to move forward and talk more about um, issues on this campus, but maybe in helping to solve those, right? There's always hope. I have a flag outside my home that says, you know, hope isn't dead. And so, and I, every time I drive home every day, I see this, you know, I just see this, see the little flag and I just keep hoping that hope is still here. So we're um, from, we're going to continue looking at success of women on campus. Thank you, Anne, for that. Um, and, uh, and we're going to move to Dr. Anthea Johnson Rowan. And she's going, she is, I met Anthea so, some years ago. Okay, let's just put it that way, some years ago. And, um, and I just told her yesterday in a meeting, if there's one person that just makes me smile as hard as I possibly can smile on my face, it's, it's Anthea. Um, so it's my honor and privilege to uh, introduce Anthea, who is passionate, passionate about um, Black women on this campus. It doesn't matter if they were just happen to be walking through or visiting. She, if she can get her eyes on, on and her voice in their ear, then she's going to find out more about them. And that's just what Anthea does. Um, so Anthea is... Uh, is the director for the College Access and Pipeline. Uh, this is the small things that I could, because her titles are so many, I just gave up. And so I could have said dot, dot, dot here, but this is what I know about Anthea, um, is that she's also the director of Equity and STEM, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And, um, and Anthea just cares not about everyone on this campus, but in particular, um, those of color, can turn to Anthea and she seems to always have and take the moments that they need. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because I think Anthea is gonna take over. Thank you, Anthea, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. That was, this, that was the most amazing intro ever. Thank you so much, Nancy. And I feel very blessed to be here at the University of Denver. I feel like the environment that I was welcomed into was definitely one that is open to change, open to let's try something new that's really going to help our students, our faculty, and our staff. And so that is a perfect match for who I am and my personality um, because when I was trying to think about what I wanted to do next, and it was early in my career, I was nervous because a lot of people in my age group who were graduating wanted to be doctors and nurses and lawyers and they had this laser path and I just didn't know what that was. Um, but one of my mentors 
said to me, well, maybe what you want to do and maybe what your life's passion is, it's not a thing. It's not a defined career, but perhaps it's something that drives you. And so she really helped me to identify that for myself, my personal mission is to help students to succeed. And I've seen that I've been able to help students to succeed as women, um, women of color, men of color. It's, it's, that's, that's the benefit is being able to really help any student that's at the university to be successful. Um, that's our goal. And I think to Nancy's point, we are at a small university and I see this as a neighborhood. I used to work at the University of Colorado at Boulder, which is massive. And I think what we each should be doing is we should be saying hello to each other. We should be saying hi, recognizing each other. And if we see somebody who's new or watching from their body language, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I should park. I don't know how to use this parking meter. We should be helping because that's who we are. And that's how people think, oh, maybe I'll come back here or, oh, you know, I was just at University of Denver and everybody seemed really friendly there. Maybe you should apply, son, daughter, whatever. And so that's kind of always where my heart has been. And I think it's also just from activities um, that I've always been a part of um, growing up and my parents. When you're military, you make friendships quickly. You hold on to those friendships because you never know who you're going to see again in the world where you're stationed. So I wanna introduce myself. My name is Anthea Johnson Rowan. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And yes, currently I proudly serve as the interim senior director for Access and Transitions, the interim director for Denver Promise and the director for the equity in science, technology, engineering and mathematics program. Or for those folks out there who are part of the program, hey STEM. That's one of my favorite things to do on campus that connects us as a community that reminds you that you are not here alone on the campus. And that's critical to us all being able to succeed. Um, I identify as Black, Caribbean, multicultural, and, uh, I'm, and I'm a woman. I'm first gen, but only be, not, not because my parents didn't graduate college. They did, but my dad was in the military and he, the military walked him through the process. And so he ended up graduating when he was in his 20s. My mom is from Barbados, West Indies. And she was put on a ship by her mother when she was 19 years old because she was either gonna be on a waiting list for three years in, um, in Barbados to be a nurse, or her mother said, you need to start your life right now. You need to be able to make choices and decisions right now. So she put her on a steam liner and off she went to England and that's where the two of them met. Um, so I'm a military brat, proudly. I am, uh, so much of who I am is, has, has been developed through both my parents and their way of living and the way that they've provided for me. I'm a mother. I'm a partner, I'm an older sister, and I'm a friend, and I'm a colleague to these amazing women who are on the call. I want to thank each and every one of you for the wisdom that you brought, and I also want to thank you for how welcoming each and every one of you have been to me on campus. I've been at the University for Den of Denver for nine years, and I, I was a winner of the Robin Morgan Award. Um, that was an incredible honor. Um, I've been doing diversity work for over 15 years um, at the University of Colorado and at University of Denver. And I've worked in diversity for over 30 years at DU and at University of Colorado. Hopefully this works. I've been having some issues. And if not, I'm just winging it. And I apologize if you won't be able to see my slide. All right. Oh, you know, one thing I did want to share with you is my first memory of University of Denver was I was in a, a phone, I was on a phone interview and it was for my first job at Center for Multicultural Excellence as the director for college access and pipeline programs. While I had arranged for childcare, but my childcare fell through. So I had a four-year-old who I had to hand some goldfish to 
put her in front of the TV and say, please watch Martha Speaks and please watch Word Girl while Mama finishes this interview. So she looks at me with her beautiful eyes, says, okay, mommy. And I go into my bedroom to continue the interview. And about three quarters of the way through, she comes back, she comes in and she says, mommy, I just want to tell you, I love you. And I just want to sit down and visit with you. And I had to tell the folks I was interviewing with, can you please excuse me? And I had to tell my daughter, can you please give mama a few minutes? And at that moment, I thought, I, I blew it. They're not going to hire me. I don't know. I'm, I'm a black woman with a child. There's stereotypes there. They're going to think I can't handle my business. And lo and behold, I was given a, an on-campus interview. So with my on-campus interview, I'm presenting and the bulb on the projector dies and the projector completely. I couldn't finish my presentation on that screen, but I, I, I promise you, I had a whisper from God in my ear the night before that said, why don't you make some hard copies? So fortunately I had some hard copies to hand out. And it was even after that, that I thought, I don't think they're gonna hire me. I think I just messed it up. I wasn't, somehow I wasn't prepared enough. And when Joanna Lab me and said, would you like to accept the job? I was elated. And one of the things she that she told me later was the reason why we decided to hire you is because you had grace under pressure <laughs> and you were able to handle your business. You know, it's, it's not often in life that we only have one thing that we deal with. And any woman here knows we're always juggling lots of different balls. And so I appreciated that Joanna Leba and the Center for Multicultural Excellence team recognized that and valued that for me as a woman and as a woman who identifies as Black. That was huge. I do want to share that I also run and have established a couple of programs for women. One of them is the Sister Network. It is a group for women who identify as Black, African, African American, who are working on their graduate degrees, their PhDs, master's degrees, JD. Um, that group has been in existence for nine years. And actually the second day that I was on campus, Dr. Tuitt connected me with Dr. Nicole Joseph, and that was how we started the group together. So it's been an amazing labor of love. For those of you who are curious about that, please email me. I'd love to share information about upcoming meetings. We also um, helped to establish with two female uh, alumni, the BW Lead or Black Women Lead Empower achieve, dedicate. And that's a group for women who identify as Black, African, African American, who are ninth grade through 12th grade. The focus for that group is education, leadership, and Black female identity. Um, what we're most proud of is that the planning committee is comprised of alums, current students, and faculty and staff from the university who identify as Black. If you're on the call, thank you. Finally, we have the Black Male Initiative Summit, which serves a similar group to Black Women Lead, except it's male, men who identify as African, African American, um, biracial, or Black, and they are eighth grade through 12th grade. And that program has been in existence for 12, for 11 years. And we, our focus is education, leadership, and Black identity. Our program's taking place on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1.30, and it's virtual. I think to add on to today says history, we had a moment in our own history where we were losing a lot of Black women, and that was when Dr. Lily Rodriguez and Tracy Adams Peters met with the leadership and came up with the idea of having a sisterhood retreat. This was a chance for women who identify as Black, African, African American, biracial, um, who were from faculty, staff, and students to come together on the campus and to really address the issues at hand, to talk about the sexism, to talk about the racism, and talk about how we can retain them at the university, and how can we have a conversation with the leadership that's really going to make changes that are impacting. 
About three years ago, we also started Hermanas Latinas because when we started the sister network, we were actually challenged at the, this point. We were told, this is fantastic, but you should just open this up to all women and all brown women. And we decided that it was not a good idea to focus on all brown women because we all have different things that we're dealing with um, as, as it relates to race, as it relates to how we show up as women in our society. And so we decided to focus on sister network and keep the focus on women who identify as black. And then about three years ago, we developed Hermanas Latinas and this was with Dr. Judy Kiyama and Lorena Gabor. And this is a chance for us to, to have a group that focuses on women who identify as Latina or Latinx. I came across an amazing quote the other day and I wanted to share this with you because when I think about women as leaders, I think we are amazing. And sometimes we are relegated to our feelings, to, to how we show up, if we cry, or it as, as collaboration or whatever, and that scene is negative. And what I wanna share is the quote, and it says, if the issue really boiled down to the way women naturally behave in the workforce, how do you explain the success of female run companies, female majority industries, or the number of company countries now free of COVID-19 due to female leadership. This is important to think about because sometimes as women, who we are is relegated to the feeling that we have or the feeling that we might have or the fact that we can't be leaders. And this for me, among many other things, is proof positive that we have amazing leadership skills. And the reason why the University of Denver really is a great institution is because of the women who work here and, and the diversity within the women who work, whether that, diverse, whether that diversity is visible or invisible, this is how we're showing up to work every day as we're doing it because we wanna be leaders in a community. I also was reflecting on DU's black history and then I was thinking, well, how come it's just not part of DU's history? And Seeking Grace was a project that women from the from Sister Network, as well as Dr. Nicole Joseph and also Dr. Catherine Crow, they came together and decided to really comb through and they physically combed through tons of annals looking for black faces. And that was really the only way to be able to identify because there aren't any records, written records of who is here. They also went to multiple churches and went through their archives to identify about one woman a year who identified as black, who is part of the University of Denver's history. I bring this up because I do think that we're at this moment where as women and as our university, we need to stop parsing out black history, women's history. We need to round out the history of, of the university by making sure that we are highlighting the Latinx history, we need to the Native American history, LGBTQ history. We need to be making sure that everybody's represented. That is fully rounding out who we are and to really recognize every single time we're on this campus, the impact of us being on hallowed ground of our Native American brothers and sisters, to, to, to really internalize that and to also sit in their shoes and figure out how does that feel to be representing, um, to be going to school on a ground where blood has been shed. That's a part of our history. One of my other favorite quotes that I came across recently was from fast web writer Tracy Jones. And she says, getting people in the door doesn't guarantee equity when an organization's norms, practices, patterns don't allow individuals to have equal influence and participation. So I also say this because when we start thinking about our history at the University of Denver and some of the challenges that our sisters have gone through either during these COVID times 
or as my 13 year old would say, pre-Rona, we notice that there are, a, we, we, can, we can recruit anybody we want, but we have a responsibility to keep, keep them here and figure out what is it about our practices that are, that are not equitable? What is it about our welcoming rituals that are not inclusive? And we need to really think about that. I was also, I was thinking also, if you, for number one, I wrote down mentoring a few, mentoring many. It wasn't that long ago that Dr. Kareen Lensfeld was holding it down for all women in engineering. So anybody who is a woman who is an engineer, if she needed mentorship, people were like, ooh, you should go see Kareen. So she was holding it down. One woman in a whole entire department with however many women needed counseling, needed support, needed academic, and in even just like that um, rub, of rub of the shoulders that, that fighters get and get pushed back into the ring, go fight. That was all Kareen. And now we have several more women in the College of Engineering, and that's just one example. Um, I also was thinking about how many leaders, how many female leaders at the highest level, especially women of color, have left. And I created a list, but it's not extensive. Dr. Rebecca Chop, and this is for many, many reasons. Dr. Sheila Davis, Dr. Deborah Mixon Mitchell, Dr. Barbara Wilcox, Dr. Liliana Rodriguez, Alana Forte Esquire, Miriam Tapia Salinas, and Tracy Adams Peters, to name a few, have left our university. And it could be for many different reasons. You know, the, the point is they're missing. They, they have, they, all of them impacted the university in many different ways and in their own way. And so we have got to really sit with ourselves with number one, if we're replacing their position with a man, we've got to really think about what is the message because it's, it is a clear message to all of us as women who are here, if at the highest levels, those positions are being replaced with men, what is the message? I think the other piece to recognize is yes, while we have been able to We've lost so many. We've also had the opportunity to also add a few more women at that higher, highest level. We, we now have Dr. Mary Clark as our provost. We also have Ms. Renee Morris as our vice chancellor for marketing and communication. So we've been able to fill up, but we also need to recognize um, the, the women who are gone, and I think the women who are coming in, how do we welcome them into our organization in the right way? Um, and how do we pay homage to the ones who have left mm -hmm. and didn't have a chance to mm -hmm. give, them a, give them a salute and give them a goodbye? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time and let me know if you have any questions. Wow, thank you again, Anthea. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is, you know, a perfect segue. Um, I was writing down um, just the message of welcoming, right? Welcoming women on campus. And that's the history, as, as Anthea left us with, the history of women of color in leadership, how difficult it is. And that is a perfect segue to the next presentation, Dr. Shelley Smith-Akuna who is uh, the current uh, Dean over at the School of Professional Psych. Um, and she was also part of a committee that was selected uh, in regards to a study, uh, uh, the study of women that then grew not only for the study of women at the DU campus, but also for the study of people of color at the DU campus. So Shelly, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, you're gonna wrap us up. Thank you so right. much. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I think, Nancy, you have my slides, so we get to go. Yeah, and this is, I mean, first of all, it's wonderful to see the just 
depth and variety of talent that we have in this presentation is absolutely amazing and great to see my friends and colleagues who share this work in such a meaningful way. It was especially fun. I've, I've actually revisited this data a couple of times, especially with Mary Clark coming on as provost saying, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about what happened and what was going on with this study? I'm going to go through pretty quickly to give you some highlights of what we did in this study and where we are now. Hopefully, though, thinking about where we're going and if we think of some of the themes about what does it mean to really create an inclusive culture, a safe culture, an affirming culture? Um, we, we've got a lot of great ideas on the table about how this could happen, and we've got a long ways to go as well. So I hope that just looking at the data and thinking about the data is going to be helpful to all of us. So the study, as we mentioned, was done in uh, 2013, results presented in 2014. If you were, in, just in case you weren't a part of it, we had 15 focus groups, we had 16 um, administrator interviews, we had between 30 and 40 percent um, participation across the campus, depending on the particular unit. And so for studies like this, this was a huge effort. Um, you know, again, some of you on the screen were very involved in this. And we were really determined to not only try to take the pulse of what was going on at the university, again, for women and people of color, but to try to create a data informed kind of continuous improvement ongoing effort in saying in a different way than we can do better. We can collect this data. These are our benchmarks and this is how we're going to move forward with this data. And we've done some of that and not enough of that, as I think you'll see when we go through the results. This also followed up with the 1997 study that was on status of women only at that point in 1997. And the results of that study is what started the Fisher Early Learning Center, for example. There was just different things about what it would take to make this um, a more family from friendly climate and also just to um, support the um, careers of women. So with our 2014 study, the, these were, I'm taking these slides from um, what was presented by the consultants at that point. And I'm glad to find a way to share these with all of you. It's kind of a, you know, one of those blast from the past feelings of looking back and thinking of what we were doing then and thinking about what we've moved forward today. But what they found is that the findings were remarkably consistent with previous studies, basically meaning that women and people of color continue to notice discrepancies, experience inequities, um, have a harder time with career advancement. And I selected only one slide as a finding just to give you a little sample. I'm not going to go through all of those, but it was fascinating to see, for example, this was looking at men versus women. If you go into the slide deck, you see that they also will parse the data with um, staff and faculty who identify as white versus who identify as people of color. So you can see, okay, women in each of these categories are noting um, experiencing more negative comments than our men. Well, think about our diversity training recently. Think about what you know about implicit bias. Yeah, of course, this is all you know, that that women and people of color are going to be more tuned into some of these problems in the workplace. But of course, you can probably guess my personal favorite finding on this slide, which is how often at DU do you hear negative comments about people based on gender? For men, only 10% of the men noticed co those comments. For women, 42.7. Well, again, like, Social psychology is going to tell you, of course, who's tuned into this, who's who's acknowledging these comments. But what what I'm curious about is you all see this and what I would love to see us thinking about is not only noticing these discrepancies, but thinking about what we do to try to change the culture and thinking about how we measure the changes over time. And again, we've done some of this, even the idea that the whole campus has had required diversity training that was extensive to where is, is that going to change that 10% figure where if these comments are happening, people are going to hear them. I don't know, but one would think so. So I can really feel us being on the right track. Um, anyway, we can go to the next slide, Nancy, because I wanted to move from that to tell you about the um, consultants in this case listed six key areas for us to uh, really address the opportunities for improvement here at DU. Uh, diversity, vision, leadership, and accountability, accountability being a big one 
second recruitment of staff, faculty of color and women, um, staff and faculty, third advancement, career advancement for again, staff and faculty of color and women, um, fourth inclusive campus climate and culture, fifth looking at resources and responsibilities, and sixth policies and procedures. Well, you can look at this list. There's nothing surprising about parsing the data in these six ways. And yet to think about the opportunity that we have to track our progress in all six of these areas, um, I've done a little bit of that based on the recommendations. The, the truth is looking back over this, we don't report on these things as much as we should. We have this framework and we could be using this framework. And I hope that again, after this presentation, we will use this framework more. I think it, it would benefit our culture and um, certainly in my own role as a leader, I would love to see my own unit rated on all of these things in a really coherent way. And it takes a lot of work for me to get those ratings to be, to be honest about that. But let me quickly go through because I want to I want to highlight what we've done in these areas. So next slide is the first recommendation was elevate the chief diversity officer position to senior level with um, the authority to ensure accountability. Well, guess what? This happened just last week, right? Finally, after a lot of different detours and a little a few different ways of looking at this, we will now have a vice chancellor for DEI starting on April 1st. This position will be on the chancellor's cabinet. And we also have new leadership in the Title IX office and the EEOC office. So if you talk to any of those folks and kind of get a picture of out of those things on the previous slide, those six areas of accountability, we finally are going to have what looks to me like adequate leadership. If we really insist that we want answers on those six slides, we've got a structure that's going to put that into place. Of course, if we look at the next slide, a few other things have happened, which is good. Develop and implement a plan to achieve greater diversity of senior level administration. Well, of course, Anthea did a great job of saying, yeah, we've all, we've lost people. And I think looking at data, understanding why we've lost people and what the plan is, not just to recruit, but to retain. The word you notice here is achieve. And if we want to achieve greater diversity, we've got to recruit and retain. At the same time, just last week, uh, Rufina Hernandez came and presented to my unit our um, yearly EEOC data. And so we're going to have those presentations every year, finally, and not just for my unit, but for senior administration. So that accountability being built in is huge. I know that search, search firms now are being tasked to create more diverse pools. Any searches that I've been on at that higher level have included that and that the Board of Trustees Membership Committee consults with WLC, FOCA, and SOCA before every search. So when we say, do we have a plan? Yeah, we, we do have a plan and we have made some progress. We did have our first female chancellor. We have a female provost, the vice chancellor for advancement. Some of the recent appointments, and, and I didn't mention Renee here, but obviously we think about other vice chancellors and our CFO um, are women. And so the percentages overall are better. They're not enough better because we've lost people. And similarly, our board of trustees is chaired by a woman. That percentage is up from about 20% when the study was first done um, with people coming off the board and going on at about 30%. So there's progress, uh, but I don't know how you all feel watching this. Again, the fact that we don't have a yearly report card in all of these areas is a problem. And I think just to be able to track that data um, in a regular way will be really helpful. Next slide goes a little bit into a couple of other things. Create a position in Office of Teaching and Learning, which will provide targeted, sophisticated training and consultation regarding diversity and inclusive excellence. Again, broadly defined, including all kinds of inclusive excellence. We did finally get that diversity, full-time diversity position. And now we have the wonderful Dr. Valentina um, Itribilov Grav, who is leading a robust sense a set of initiatives I know in my department just to have that go-to resource. So you hear the recommendation, great idea. When you have a really great resource there, it's made a huge, it's made a big difference in my department. And as I mentioned, all DU employees have completed DEI training this year. So next slide, which is a little bit tougher, work with units on communicating and standardizing policies and procedures. Well, 
certainly in the interim role, Dr. Tom Romero, I know has met with units a couple of times and trying to at least even do the audit to say what are the policies and procedures? How could we standardize them? How could we share best practices? Uh, there's a, a way to go, ways to go there. We will be hearing that the pay equity study, which again was one of the recommendations at a more weedy level in this report, um, the results I believe are due to be released later this month. And certainly um, HR has been working on all kinds of best practices policies. I know that creating better family support is something again that we've consulted with them on and, and that that's been um, more of a resource than it's been in the past. To kind of look forward though, the next slide, Nancy, to say, I mean, there's lots of remaining questions, challenges and opportunities. How is this no, new structure really gonna create the kind of ownership of these initiatives? Teresa mentioned this in her presentation. You know, we've got this new structure, how is it gonna work? We talk about accountability. Are we gonna actually track progress? Are we gonna think about the data in these six areas? Um, a specific example of that, how do we, what happened with that DEI training? Is it actually changing the culture? Who's measuring that? What's happening in terms of actually looking at the efficacy of what we're trying? And what's been mentioned today that's just, you know, great for my soul. I hope we keep thinking about how to push this forward. Intersectionality, not having all of these things broken up and put into silos, but really thinking about experience, human experience. Um, I, I did not put this into a slide because again, some of the stuff is, is uh, you know, you don't know the data is perfect and all of that, but uh, the pay gap remains. I did get the data for the last four years on faculty salaries and it's up and down. I mentioned the range. And if you look at the range, because I put it from lower to higher, you'd think we're, ma we're making progress in every area. Actually, the 86% in the assistant professor range was last year. It had gone up and then it went back down. You can see that, at, that this is actually significant progress from the study before to at least be in that close to 90% range. Why is it lower every year and not making consistent progress. If you look at national data, the progress has been more consistent actually and is closer in the average of about the 92, 93% range consistently and not the ups and downs that we see. And finally, we've heard about membership and leadership development and where does allyship fit into all of that? I love seeing all of my colleagues here. These are fantastic women. Uh, we, we need to share the burden in lots of ways, I'm sure more than we are and keeping that going is really important as well. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And I know hopefully questions, discussion, really great to be here. Thank you so much. That was so eye-opening as I feel like every discussion with you is. Um, we do have some time for additional questions to be put in the Q&A. I also have put the link to the HerDU 2021 webpage that includes the opportunity for nominations for the awards, as well as the uh, link to submit your RFP, because I know a lot of you out in our audience today and my fellow presenters have lots of great ideas for workshops. We'd love to have you involved. Um, so, looks like we've got a quiet crowd today. It's at lunchtime. People might be be eating, um, or you guys are just so amazing that we've left nothing to question. Nothing left to question. I have a question. I'll, I'll kick us off just for one, um, a really small question. Um, so what, if you were to prioritize, and, and I'm giving you all a chance to think about it and sweat it out because it's, it's a, if we were to prioritize the next thing that we all in concert need to work together to help all all across campus, but in particular women across campus, what do you think that would be? Shelly, I'm gonna start with you with a very brief one or two sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm really struck when I thought about following up on the diversity training, really calling out and identifying the ways that people are, um, you know, microaggressions, hurt, the, the just the, the culture, the kind of underside of the culture, I think, especially at DU, mm -hmm. as we're friendly and warm. And it's, you know, I've been here since 1992. I love this place. And the, the parts of the culture that don't change 
if there are a way that those conversations could be both more candid, but also examples of how um, departments have changed, if that best practices was really, were really about culture change, I think that would be super powerful. That was more than one minute, but yes. Okay, I, mean, I think I'll go backwards, Anthea. I think what I would say actually goes back to Dr. DePrince's presentation, and that really is making sure that all of us are a part of these conversations related to women's issues. So when when Dr. DePrince was talking about women's about violence against women and violence against genders, that really is all of our responsibility. And mm -hmm. if we have men in our group, we need to be working with them and talking to them um, about respect and how to respect women. And I think for women, we also have to listen and believe them when they tell us things and we need to act immediately. And I think then the next step at the university is when we report it, there's gotta be some sort of action immediately. Mm. All right, Ann. Um, I, Nancy, you know, I have a little bit of a problem with authority streak. So, um, I would actually say, I sort of refuse to answer the question. Cause I think we keep getting told we can do one thing at a time. And uh, uh, what, we, nice. what we end up seeing is that these problems are interrelated. So like, how do we find the intersections? Mm -hmm. Like there's such a beautiful intersection between what Shelly just said and what Anthea just said around respect or how we treat one another, which is tied into um, different ways you can demonstrate uh, respect and well treatment from pay equity to not say abusing each other. But so, so how do we find those intersection points mm. um, and not let people tell us that there's a single priority? I understand we have to be effective, but I actually think from an organizing perspective, we can be more effective when we show more people that they're this, these things we want um, help, help them too. Um, and so I would, so I, I wouldn't have a single priority, but I have an, uh, problems with authority. So there you go. And, and why, why I love you so much. Okay, Teresa, you can, you can, you can refute the question or, or answer it uh, depending on, on how you're feeling at the day or just in general. Okay. So, so the, uh, when I think about an issue, um, I think we're all going to be facing, it's going to be around uh, work equity the work-life balance, um, how this past 11 months has affected us in all, across the board, our children, our, our parents, uh, uh, everything we do. And it's not, it's gonna change us, right? And so how do we, how do we help people grow? Oh, wow. And also how do we help people reorient into this new world, right? But I have to bring one other thing up. I think what we need to realize through all this and the history of this of the women's coalition and the women's groups, we ebb and flow for a reason. There are initiatives and, 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 and issues that come to the forefront and we're passionate around them. And then we back off because some work is getting done or maybe we thought work was getting done. Like Shelly said, you know, we did this big study, we had all these things and it took how long to get some of them to actually happen. But we gotta keep doing the good work. And, and when we ebb and flow, when we're at that bottom, we can't stop. It doesn't mean it's time to stop. It just means, okay, we hit that little stone in the river, <laughs> but we're, we're gonna get going again. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think we need to do is continue the hard work. Yeah. Tally, uh, we have a question in the question and the answer. And I thought that that you would wrap up by answering this question and then sending us off as we go about our busy day. And again, the most enjoyable hour and a half of my day um, because I get to look at all your beautiful faces and uh, and be and remember what what it's about to be together in this work. So, uh, Tally, I'm so sorry, my friend, but I'm going to ask you to answer the question today. Yeah, thank you. So I'll, I'll read the question out loud. And it is, what are the women's coalition, what is the women's coalition doing to support the No More Pios initiative? And actually, Tally, I'm so sorry because I'm paying attention. Um, uh, Clara would like to answer that for uh, out of the Office of Diversity and Equity and Inclusion. Um, no, I think, 
or Clara, do you want to answer it? Or were you just saying that we were answering it live? Yes, the latter. You okay. can take it. You're the expert. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Okay, I'm so sorry. Okay, got gotcha, you, woman. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I appreciate you advocating for Clara. So thank you. Uh, okay, so again, what are the, what is the Women's Coalition doing to support the No More Pios initiative? Um, Follow-up question, how is the power and momentum behind women's issues being leveraged to support other marginalized communities? So I will be honest, at this time, we have not formally taken a stance on the Women's Coalition um, and the No More Pios MOOC um, initiative. I am also Vice President of the Staff Advisory Council, and we sent out a survey to all staff asking if the staff as a whole want us to make a statement of support for the No More Pios initiative. We have gotten resounding mixed results. And as SAC representatives, as a representatory body, um, we are still putting together the thoughts and ideas around that. Um, and hopefully that survey results will be out by mid-March um, to answer Melanie's question in the chat. Um, and so we at the Women's Coalition, we are going to address this, but we are going to wait till we have the broader representation from the new restructuring. Because what I've learned from the SAC survey is there are a lot of voices and there are a lot of people pro removing Pioneer moniker. There are people who are against it. Everybody, regardless of whether or not you agree or disagree, we have to give everybody a voice because as women who are fighting for our voice and we're fighting for that voice to be the women's coalition and women at the table, not, oh, Nancy's here in this meeting. Nancy's also a woman. She can speak for all women because we are not one person. We share a commonality, but there's more. And we wanna make sure that we're fully representing everything. And when we present the SAC survey results, it is not going to be a black or white issue. This is not a black or white issue. I personally completely would love to see the pioneer moniker change, but it is my role as a chair of an organization, as a vice president of SAC, to speak for everybody within our constituency. And, um, to that other point, how is the power and momentum behind women's issues being leveraged to support other marginalized communities? That is something that we are heavily addressing within the HERDU programming and looking at our allyship, looking at how we uh, tailor our conversations to lift others up. Um, the other aspect of that is we do have the strategic planning process put in place for the Women's Coalition. However, part of that restructure is coming from this planning process for our strategic goals and plan that we realize right now we have about 10 women doing all of this work and that is not enough. So we need to restructure. We need to kick this strategic plan into place. And part of that is recognizing and um, implementing how are we allies to our other historically underrepresented, marginalized groups, how many of us are wearing so many of those identities already ourselves and how can we work together? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and mention one of my favorite sayings, the rising tide lifts all ships. So we are not in the same boat, but we are in the same ocean and we are going to strengthen the involvement across campus because one of the things I've heard over and over again, and one of the things I've personally seen is it's the same women and our panel is unfortunately nothing different. It is the same women being asked to show up every single time because we are the loud ones. We are the ones who have more visible um, recognition within our community. And I know we're not the only ones with something to say. Mm. So please, if, you, if these are issues that are important to you, I want you to keep an eye out for those women's coalition info mm -hmm. sessions, get more involved, help us be better allies for everybody on campus and help us in all of our boats, whether or not we're in a dinghy or a yacht, help that rising tide with us all. Mm -hmm. so. 
Thank you. Thank you, Tally, so much. Tally, there's a, there's a question in uh, the question and answer that you may want to answer um, about when the SAC survey is going to come out. Right, yes. Yeah. So we are hoping for it mid-March. I'm getting my team's information on the communication council who put together the survey or the communication committee, excuse me, within SAC. They're giving me the findings this by this Friday. I will be revisiting those with the executive committee and with Jaren um, how um, to kind of talk about what the findings are, how can we best disseminate this information, and then within the SAC um, newsletter for March, um, we will be giving an update. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll close by sending it back to Clara in the Office of uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I just want to thank her for all the work that she is doing to organize all of these sessions over this, you know, incredible seven weeks, I think, right, that we mentioned. And everybody else that has helped us today to look in their chat, the DU captioner, um, uh, Wesley, Wesley over at IT, everybody, thank you for helping us be successful. So Clara, let's, it's off to you. Thank you so much, Nancy, especially for those kind words. Um, I owe it all to the rest of my team as well. Um, and of course, you all. I'd like to thank you all one last time um, for presenting this morning. It was a wonderful session. Uh, final reminder for those of you who joined us live today, you will receive an email with a link for a session evaluation. We greatly appreciate your feedback. Uh, please view the online schedule and register for our upcoming Diversity Summit sessions. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you will join us for our next panel, which is later on today, the Disability and Neurodiversity panel from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Thank you all so much, and uh, enjoy the little bit of the warmth we have. <laughs> <laughs>